Hi, and welcome to The Horn, a podcast from International Crisis Group. I'm Alan Boswell. Today, I'm joined by David Mozerski. David is a former Horn of Africa director and was a longtime Sudan analyst for us at Crisis Group, so it's great to have him here back with us today. After leaving Crisis Group, David worked with the African Union on peace talks and then founded the Program on Conflict, Climate Change, and Green Development at Berkeley University. For years now, David's work has focused on the link between climate change and conflicts, both around the world and specifically here in this region. Today, David is the president and co-founder at Energy Peace Partners, and he's here to talk with me about the link between climate and peace building, something we here at Crisis Group are also thinking a lot about these days. Uh, Last week, our president and CEO, Rob Malley, briefed the UN Security Council on this very topic. So what brings us today to this climate conversation? Well, quite simply, it's the, the conviction that climate change is already shaping and is going to continue to shape the future of conflict, and that we ignore that correlationship, that relationship at our peril. Given the rate at which global warming is already outpacing projections, uh, the increasing rise in sea levels, the growing scarcity of resources, the frequency of extreme weather events, it would be quite simply a dereliction of duty, of our duty, if peace and security actors didn't come together with diplomats, scientists, activists, and, and others in taking this challenge seriously. We'll link to the video of Rob's full presentation in the show notes. Just one more note, which is that we recorded this conversation with David at the end of February, which already feels like a different world. We think it's more relevant than ever. Dave, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me, Alan. Many of our listeners, you know, hear and many of them know that climate change can cause conflict. But how exactly? I don't think there's a simple answer to that question. The sort of agreed upon or consensus language is probably that climate change contributes to conflict, not that it's a direct causal link because it isn't. There are different ways that climate change can contribute to conflict or drivers of conflict. It can disrupt economic livelihoods. It can change weather patterns, as we know, and those changes can contribute to often very nuanced political or economic situations, often in places that already have conflict risk. So when you look at the Horn, you have the conflict in Darfur, which was evolved out of uh, a background of climate change impacts, climate change impacts in Somalia and other parts of the Horn, where you have a history of conflict exacerbated by Uh, climate change impacts and in one way or another um, contributing to an an ongoing or perhaps worsening of of conflict. So I do want to talk about the Darfur example in more depth in a second. Um, I mean, can you talk us through the the, the research on this? Because like you said, because it's a contributing factor and it's difficult to parse, the research is, is... somewhat uh, muddled, um, if you agree with me that it's that it's somewhat muddled. Um, how does the industry or, you know, the people you talk to thinking about actually trying to, to define that link a bit more clearly? Well, I don't think that there's common agreement. One of the commonly cited terms is something that the U.S. military came up with of climate change as a threat multiplier. So it's something that can exacerbate other existing conflict risks or threats, um, but not as something that would necessarily trigger conflict on its own. You also have a lot of, uh, of the work in the climate security world tends to focus on water as the most obvious potential driver or catalyst of, of new conflict looking forward when you anticipate the impacts of climate change. But I think it's also very nuanced. So if we can go to Darfur for a second, Dar- Darfur, the conflict in Darfur grew out of climate-driven migration and changes in migration patterns. So desertification pushed pastoralist groups further east and further south, where they started to mostly Arab pastoralist groups, mostly Arab pastoralist groups without access to land rights in Darfur, where they started to have increasing conflict with farming communities, who were African farming communities. And that particular fault line of Arab-African divide didn't really exist in the region prior to the 80s and 90s as a meaningful identity fault line, but it became one. And when you had the emergence of local conflict, you then had the 
emergence of opposition groups, the SLA and GEM. And the government response was to take sides in that conflict, as you know. And so it was to manipulate that fault line that that grew out of that rather than um, sort of address the drivers. Yeah. And for those who don't know, uh, Dave actually was the crisis group analyst when uh, Darfur was was uh, really raging. Um, and so really, you know, watched that and researched that really, really up close. I'm, I mean, would you say, I'm just curious if you think the Darfur conflict would have broken out without also the climate angle? Um, maybe. Okay. I mean, it, it, there was conflict at, all over Sudan, mm. right? Without necessarily having a conflict driver in South Sudan, for example, but in peripheral parts of the country, you had conflict. Um, you had marginalized communities, including throughout Darfur, but that particular driver, which led to the local dynamics of pastoralist groups at odds with African farming communities, emerged initially out of local tensions that were influenced and driven in part by climate impacts. Right. And then, and then from there, there was sort of feedback loops that played very negatively into the politics. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I mean, part of what's been interesting in, in working on this over a number of years is that when I was working with Crisis Group on this, and I was in the weeds, as you said, as, as you are now on, um, on South Sudan, and um, I mean, there was some talk at the time of climate change being a driver, and Ban Ki-moon famously wrote an op-ed in 2007 or 2008 calling Darfur the first climate war. And at the time, I, I thought it was sort of ridiculous because I was up to my eyeballs in the politics of it, and climate wasn't mentioned as one of the... There were, there were these clear man-made decisions along the way that were driving and exacerbating conflict. But with some distance and having taken a step back, actually, I think I can, I've come to appreciate that the underlying, some of the underlying causes that have exacerbated tensions, um, contributed to conflict that are climate driven are quite important and were not being recognized and captured in the conflict mitigation resolution approaches. I mean, another part of this is that is that in peace talks themselves, the, you know, what gets talked about in peace talks is usually political grievances and political solutions. Um, and and uh, one part of this would be that if climate is a major driver of it and the peace talks themselves are mainly, mainly focused on political issues, in some ways, we're not really probably resolving the conflicts very well if we're not addressing all the drivers. I think that's absolutely right. And it, it sort of forces a new consideration maybe of how we articulate and how we understand root drivers of conflict. Because the fact is that drivers of conflict are changing or at least climate change is impacting some of the drivers of conflict. And uh, that's, I, I fear, only going to continue going forward. Um, it's not going to be limited to Darfur or Somalia. I mean, Africa is among the most vulnerable regions to climate impacts in the world, although it's the least responsible for, for man-made climate change. Um, it's, a, it's among the most um, vulnerable. And there are a number of examples and also uh, research that shows that the likelihood of climate impacts leading to conflict is higher in countries with ethnic divides, for example. Um, and so I think thinking about what does that mean for political analysis and conflict analysis, and what does that mean for um, conflict resolution approaches is something that deserves serious consideration. Unfortunately, I don't think that it's gotten... right. Uh, as much attention yet as as it probably needs. I mean, in a way, you can really see this playing out in terms of, you know, how things often work at peace tables, which 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 you've been at, um, is oftentimes when it comes to conflict over land and conflict over over local power sharing and things like that, we are using boundaries that were drawn on maps many many decades ago. And if the climate has shifted to make those boundaries sort of no longer that applicable for at least where different groups are and where they can have livelihoods. Um, I mean, I think I think probably all of us who've watched conflicts have have seen how, you know, oftentimes the old boundaries are the ones you revert back to because that's what's agreed upon. But, but, I mean, you can see how if people aren't thinking creatively about that, that can actually become a, a, an obstacle towards peace. Yeah, and I, I think one of the things that if you look at the global response to climate change and where there's innovation and where there are new approaches, um, new investment. And there are countless great examples of this all over the world. 
there just aren't very many in the peace building and conflict resolution field that I can point to. And so part of what, what I'm working on now and, and what we're doing is trying to help develop a bridge between climate solutions and creative thinking and investment around climate solutions with conflict risk and, and, and conflict resolution and peace building. Right. And so moving on to that, I mean, another issue that, that we've discussed before, and I know that you're working on quite a bit, um, and I think is, is less discussed in this in this context, is the massive carbon footprint of what is this sort of peace building infrastructure and humanitarian infrastructure, and even the diplomatic infrastructure towards all these places that experience um, conflict. And I think anyone who has worked in these contexts and flown around under will understand this quite well. You have massive compounds uh, running on generators. Um, you know, I, I often end up on aeroplanes and helicopters in which I'm one of the only passengers. I just came from uh, a flight in South Sudan where it was me and one other person on an entire flight. So even doing this work, um, you know, there's quite a large carbon carbon footprint. Absolutely. So you have large peacekeeping missions, humanitarian operations all over the world in, in crisis settings that often are deployed in poorly electrified, underdeveloped settings and disproportionately and are still using the I'm generalizing, but still often using the same um, the same approaches that they were using 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 40 years ago towards um, towards powering their operations, uh, for example. And so there are opportunities to modernize, to shift away from a reliance on electricity through burning diesel and diesel generators in off-grid settings, which is far and away the default mode by which peacekeep- UN peacekeeping international aid missions uh, power themselves in poorly electrified countries. And South Sudan is, is a great example. It's one of the least electrified countries in the world. And over the last, certainly since the 2013 civil war, but I think we can go back even further, the international footprint in many places is the single largest power producer and power consumer in the country. And all power in South Sudan basically comes from burning of imported diesel. And it's dirty, it's expensive, but it also is, uh, it, it essentially leaves nothing behind. Yeah, and a lot of that is from the international community. Absolutely, yeah. And what we've started to do is try to explore the question, not just from sort of an environmental carbon footprint, but, for, but from a conflict analysis uh, perspective. So looking at diesel supply chains and conflict settings, if the humanitarian footprint in a country is powered, powering its diesel generators through uh, purchase of local mm-hmm. diesel, who controls those supply chains? Right. And who where are they is, buying from? Exactly. And, and uh, what we found is that often, not always, but often diesel supply chains overlap with the war economy. Yeah. It, at times in South Sudan, at times in Somalia, in Syria, in other places. So it doesn't happen in every case, but you have this negative unintended consequence. And the way that that these missions and operations are set up is they're set up as temporary response mechanisms that often end up existing for years and years in protracted crises. I mean, is that the main answer to the question that when posed, why do these operations have such massive carbon footprints? Why is renewables, for instance, not a major priority? I, I assume the sort of response is usually the fact that these are supposed to be temporary, you know, and they're, of course, emergency responses, even though, of course, many of these missions end up lasting way beyond what their mandate envisions. Absolutely. Uh, that's part of the answer. Uh, part of the answer is path dependency, that this is how it's been done, and this is where the expertise and knowledge um, lies. Part of the answer is that it has not thus far really been a priority. So it ha- there hasn't been, until recently at least, a priority to transition at scale, either from donors or from most agencies, most UN and missions. There are exceptions to that, but they are the exception rather than the rule. And then a, f- a final uh, explanation is the financing mechanism. One impact or one implication of these being temporary crisis response uh, missions is that they're often funded on 12-month cycles. And so when you talk about renewable energy, replacing diesel with renewable energy, a solar system, for example, is more, it's a one-time upfront cost. It's a more expensive investment initially. And aid agencies or peacekeeping missions can't always, don't always have the capital to finance that on a 12-month budget. It's cheaper to buy diesel on a 12-month, but when you expand that out over 10 years, 
it's many times more expensive. And so what really strikes me from from this conversation is starting at the beginning where we talk about the links between climate change and conflict and then the fact that within the industry itself, you know, that has arisen to try to resolve these conflicts. In fact, within that industry, there, there's really basically that link hasn't been made about its own carbon footprint and its own, you know, contribution on, on what is, you know, a tiny sliver out of overall, but still the fact that the conflict resolution industry itself has not really responded to what's required, you know, to eventually decarbonize is, is, is quite striking. And I think it also... Um, you know, I think many might assume that the UN, the United Nations, might be a leader in this field rather than a laggard, at least when it comes to the peacekeeping missions. That's certainly uh, true so far. And as you know, the UN is, is a enormous institution and it's a slow moving bureaucracy. And the good news is that uh, this past September, the UN Secretary General um, announced the new climate action plan, which does commit the UN Secretariat, including UN peacekeeping, to an ambitious new set of climate goals, which include a commitment of being 80% renewable by 2030. So for the first time, there's a concrete target on the books that uh, UN missions will have to, have to uh, orient around. Up until this point, there have been only a handful of examples of, for example, renewable energy deployment in field missions. And there's a risk that this transition is thought about from sort of a technical logistical perspective, and it's handled almost ex explicitly or exclusively uh, by the engineering department. And part of what I think is exciting about this opportunity and we're working on uh, trying to support is also thinking about this as a way to support peace building and conflict mitigation. And how do you take advantage of the UN uh, as an entry point for renewable energy deployment in South Sudan, in DRC, in Darfur, in Mali or CAR, and some of the least electrified countries in the world to also introduce essentially new climate solutions, new renewable energy investment in countries that desperately need it but are not uh, generally receiving climate investment. And so, Dave, you actually came from, you know, this world of conflict resolution, both with Crisis Group and then afterwards, you also continued to work on, on peace building and conflict resolution. And now you've been working on this issue for years. You actually left, you know, the straight up peace talks world uh, to, to kind of work on, on this link. So having worked on it for years, you know, tell us what you're really focusing on now. So we, uh, so I work with an organization called Energy Peace Partners, which is a small organization, but we bring together um peace building and conflict resolution ex expertise or backgrounds uh, together with renewable energy development, renewable energy finance, and climate security. And as I said, part of the goal is to serve as a bit of a bridge between the really exciting innovation and developments that are happening around renewable energy, around uh, climate solutions in parts of the world. They're just generally not reaching the places where I've been working, where you're working, and where I think the potential impact could be enormous. And so we work on two tracks. One is a, a research and policy track um, jointly with the Stimson Center. We have a program called Powering Peace that is looking really at how, to, how the UN can facilitate this transition, what role does energy play in different conflict settings, um, and how introducing renewable energy into, for example, peacekeeping missions or international field missions can help contribute to, to peace. And the other is trying to uh, work on this financing conundrum that I, I mentioned. And there we've been developing a new mechanism called the Peace Renewable Energy Credit, which is a new financing mechanism to support renewable energy projects in fragile settings. And we are uh, either about to or will just have, depending on when this airs, issue the first Peace Renewable Energy Credits from a project in Goma, DRC, um, which we're very excited about. So, so how exactly would these Peace Renewable Energy Credits work? So the Peace Renewable Energy Credit is something we've been developing that is an extension of a climate finance mechanism that already exists in other parts of the world. Uh, a renewable energy credit is like a sister mechanism to a carbon credit, specifically around energy generation. And there's been a billion plus dollar market that has grown over the last few years in North America and Europe primarily, um, driven in part by corporations who are seeking to, uh, who have made commitments to be 50%, 70%, 100% renewable. And so this corporate demand for renewable energy claims is driving new investment in new places. 
the architecture for issuing and trading those credits does not, for the most part, does not exist in Africa, certainly not in fragile states. And so what we've done is work to extend that architecture so that these credits can be generated initially from this project in, in DRC, and that they would could then be sold to a corporate buyer. And they would the corporate buyer would be interested in buying these for their own sustainability usage claim, as well as for the impact part. What makes this a peace renewable energy credit is that it comes from a project in a fragile state. It's new renewable energy generation, and there's a, compuni- uh, there's a community stakeholder engagement component. So in the GOMA uh, pilot project that I mentioned, the credits are being generated from a new 1.3 megawatt mini grid that's been developed by a company called Nuru. Each megawatt hour generates a credit. Those have been will be sold. Um, the revenue from that will support a nighttime lighting project in the neighborhood where the mini grid was going, the Indosho neighborhood, which the developer uh, came up with through a consultation with the community. They said that the a, a big impact for them, a big need is nighttime lighting gets insecure at, at dark. So the ability to translate that renewable energy generation into a credit, which works in the international sustainable climate finance framework, allows for a new way to monetize renewable energy in settings that otherwise lack the economic incentives that are driving renewable energy investment. First, what are the obstacles you're really facing on that mission to uh, to start to transfer some of these giant UN missions towards different forms of energy? Uh, there's not. There has not historically been a lot of attention on energy, for example. So I think one of the striking takeaways for me over the last couple of years has been realizing the degree to which energy is really a hidden issue in conflict settings. In the analysis, or in, in the political analysis that I did for years that you're doing, um, now that there's a whole sector that's built around, and also in within the, the response mechanisms, within the UN, within aid missions, UN does not have great da- data. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, there are some estimates that the humanitarian aid sector spends 5% of its budget on energy, mm-hmm. and UN peacekeeping, some estimates also in the same ballpark. I mean, that that's over a billion dollars a year. It could be up to a billion, 1.5, 1.6 billion dollars a year on diesel and generators. And um, this new commitment by uh, the UN Climate Action Plan is a big step forward because now we have a goal that we can work towards. But the UN is not uh, necessarily prepared at the moment to, or nor does it necessarily know how to undertake that that transition. Renewable energy has completely transformed the world in the last decade, or m- many parts of the world. And there's been a renewable energy revolution with hundreds of billions of dollars deployed a year. Mm-hmm. It just is not reaching. Yeah. I mean, it, frankly, it's not reaching much of the developing world, but it's certainly not reaching fragile states. And I suppose one of the one of the links um, that, you know, maybe you're also pursuing is the I is the idea that even changing, you know, uh, some of how we use energy in these uh, places can create, you know, if you use solar panels uh, it, instead of diesel, uh, that itself is creating local jobs, which can itself, you know, um, uh, be something that, that that helps some of these societies pull themselves out of conflict, as well as just the fact that you're leaving behind a real energy source, you know, when and if these missions leave. There's an opportunity to sort of build out the peace dividends of tomorrow through the energy footprints that are left behind. So instead of leaving behind a bunch of diesel generators like Uniman is doing in, in Darfur, they could have left behind solar mini grids and transitioned those over and coupled that with capacity building and training programs around solar or um and that isn't part of the toolkit at the moment. And that's part of where I think we need to go. It's, it's some of what we're, we're working on. Um, and I think there's a big opportunity there to integrate these kind of forward-leaning climate solutions into, into how the international community responds to crises and conflicts. Excellent. Uh, Dave, thanks for coming on our podcast. Thanks so much, Al. Thanks for listening to The Horn. We will be back in two weeks with another episode. Once again, I'm Alan Boswell, and this podcast is a production of the International Crisis Group. You can read our reports at crisisgroup.org or follow us on Twitter at Crisis Group. This episode was produced by Mae Francis.